And we're live. <laughs> Go. <laughs> All right. All right. So this is obviously like the first, or as a, we talked about earlier, this is the second episode of Drinks and Dogs, considering the first conversation that we we all had. Um, but this is Drinks and Dogs. You know, Drinks and Dogs is, we made it just to kind of bring the community back together again and show all the different type of like dog training stuff that we do and the people throughout the country and, you know, just show that, you know, it is like-minded in the sense that we don't have to continuously, you know, kind of tear each other down and we can build each other up and share all this information. And like, you know, the gentlemen I have on today, uh, Mike and KD are extremely intelligent um, and they're out, you know, they're throughout the country. Um, but, you know, the cool thing about it is that we can kind of share our perspectives and go, f- and go from there and share our knowledge and share everything that we have and, you know, that way it brings bigger to the community versus tearing people down. We can build each other up and all that other fun stuff. Um, so, so, so for people who don't necessarily know who uh, Mike or KD are, which is, would be shocking to me <laughs> if you didn't, you know, Mike Nesbeth from Grassroots, uh, extremely intelligent, really tar- uh, articulate uh, trainer uh, when it comes to like behavior modification and all the other stuff that you guys do. Same thing with KD, um, extremely articulate, you know, very intelligent trainer as well. Um, and I just want to say thanks, guys. I, you know, I appreciate you guys for, you know, joining me with this. Um, I hope to have you guys on more and more as we we build drinks and dogs together. Um, yes, yeah, so I, you know, appreciate you guys for being on. Appreciate the invite. Glad to be here. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Thanks for having us for the first one too, man. Yeah, man. This is this shit's fun. I'm, this is a charity breaker right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the fun stuff. Uh, I'm pretty pumped with it. So uh, before we get started and you know talking and everything. Um, I have to say thanks to Ray Allen, uh, one of our sponsors. Um, if you use the drinks and dogs promo code, you will get 10% off. Also, thanks to where's my uh, uh, margaritas to go. Uh, they they got a new tequila coming out that has been sponsoring or is going to be sponsoring Primal Cannon, and that's what we have here. Um, it's the dude with dreads. So, and I have a dude with dreads here. So, there you go. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. So it all it all works out uh, well. Um, so yeah, guys. I mean, if you guys want to get started on some questions, or let's talk about actually how are you guys doing with the whole Corona thing. Let the Canadian go first. There you go. We're doing all right. You know, we're we're, we're looking at it. <laughs> now, you know, we, they we make just Corona saw... cans. <laughs> right in Canada, at least. Hey. Um, <laughs> We're, we're, uh, we, we transitioned to quite a bit of virtual training and stuff. Um, we have a, a kind of a virtual video library right now uh, that, you know, trains specific behaviors or helps people kind of work on, you know, work on loose leash walking with their dog. Um, the, the cool thing is, is that we have um, it broken down into a few different uh, areas. So we have a working dog area uh, where we focus on everything kind of working dogs, tracking, detection, bite work. Um, then we have pet obedience, just regular obedience, as well as uh, kind of a, a nether section that's specifically geared towards puppies. So we've been kind of moving a lot online, uh, but other than that, regular schedule programming. Nice. So is uh, how's like the law enforcement side working out for you guys with all this stuff? Uh, it's a the hard part is is getting dogs in right now, um, but you know a lot of our at least our local guys they're you know, admins have canceled their, their monthly training days. Oh, yeah. So everyone's kind of spinning their thumbs and waiting for green light to get started back. Uh, but other than that, you know, we're with the dogs that we have here, we're still working up through the program <laughs> available. Yeah. That's the, I mean, that's what like the getting dogs in has been a pain in the ass. I have, I have two dogs out right now. I just can't, can't even get it in the States. Yeah. All right, Katie, how's uh, Florida? You guys are opening, right? Like, you guys are already open. You know, I got to be honest with you. I don't have a fucking clue. Um, (laughs) You know, what goes on outside of my house is of very little significance to me. Um, I think the biggest change in my personal life was the brewery that's a $4 Uber ride from my house was closed. I mean, that was a kick in the nuts because, I mean... $4.87 Four dollars and eighty-seven cents on a Friday night Uber ride. I notice when that place closes. Yeah. Outside of that, I mean, it's a you know, 
I guess the beaches were closed. I don't go to the beach. Um, I guess they are open now. Um, it, it, you know, as far as Florida is concerned and what's going on, no impact. Now, as far as business, um, I had a close down enrollment to my canine blueprint online training program, which I've been running for the past two years. I was doing the online stuff like way before Corona and a lot, you know, you guys, know that. Um, a lot of people who follow me know that. And it's been interesting because, you know, people changing their lifestyles, people now suddenly being home more. Well, they're interacting with their dogs more. And I've noticed either one or two, one of two things is happening. Either A, they're trying to be productive and positive and take advantage of that extra time with their dog and reach out to me to find out more information about my program. Or B, now that they're home with their dog more, they're seeing how completely out of control the dog is yeah. <laughs> and how they are unable to manage the dog's behavior, which has them reaching out. Um, needless to say, Closing enrollment to my program was not something I anticipated I was going to have to do. So when it happened, it was like, wow, I have to do this because I work very intimately with my clients. Um, the Blueprint program is really intensive, four to six months long. They have my phone number. They speak to me every day. I'm monitoring their videos. And my existing clients, I mean, I had people who would maybe send me three, three videos a week. They're sending me eight videos a day because they're home. Yeah, <laughs> and and the, the terms of the contract is I don't limit what they send me. You send it to me, I will coach you. I will provide you feedback. Well, I mean, some people are getting their money's worth, man. Let me yeah. tell you, um, and good, good for them. Good for them. Um, I'm proud of them. So, what it has done is, I believe, pressure is a wonderful catalyst for growth, and everything yeah. we do. So, the pressure to accommodate as many people as I can. What it's done is it's allowed me now to put a little bit more time into creating a new program that will be a little bit less of me and it'll be self-paced and people can work through the modules. Um, I've seen a lot of value in providing online education for dog owners because I don't do online dog training. I do online education for dog owners, which there's a big difference in it. We can get into that rabbit hole later. Um, but, you know, it's allowed me to make some changes so that I can help more dogs and communicate with more dog owners. So, I mean, I, I got no complaints right now. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, I mean, like, that's like one of the cool things I think about, like with the online stuff is that it's and like, we noticed it too, man, because we transferred over, I want to say a year ago to doing a lot of online through like our PCU course, like the one I do um, from our website, just like, you know, some breakdown going through the different stuff that we talk about, like behavior, you know, um, and then just like correcting behaviors, fixing behaviors. Essentially, it's like kind of training dog trainers. So we've had, you know, that course for the last about year, year and a half. And we were kind of geared ready for it. But as soon as like the Corona thing happened, it was always like, OK, like now we got to switch digitally into this, you know, hence, you know, drinks and dogs and all the other stuff that we've been doing, um, you know, during that time. You know, I think like that's one the cool thing that uh, you know, Katie brought up was like, you know, you know, pressure. <laughs> Pressure can either break you or build you. And, you know, that was like the thing that, you know, we've obviously all three of us have done. And we've we've built up uh, another avenue as far as dog training. But the really cool thing is like I like about it is that, you know, especially with online, you know, now we have all these people have access to like like amazing trainers. Like, you know, you guys are online. You know, other people are expanding their online programs. Um, and, you know, now it's becoming more of a, I want to say, it's, it's more of a tangible thing now to work with like you guys. You know, like, you know, for example, like I'm in California, you know, Katie, you're in Florida, you know, Mike's in Canada, like on the far east side of Canada, like, you know, there's different the good areas. Side. Good yeah. side. <laughs> so the, the cold side, I, I think. <laughs> the, um, but I mean, I think that's awesome. And I think like the, and like, that's one thing I've noticed too, with the actual online training is just people gaining all these different perspectives, being able to have like, to be able to reach out to you guys uh, and, you know, be able to, you know, you know, talk to me, talk to you guys and kind of go through uh, and work with just different people. So I mean, like, that's one of like, the really cool things I've seen, you know, that come from this whole Corona uh, crap. All that other, all that it's, other fun stuff. It's been interesting because as Corona hit and people started, other people in the community started adapting and making changes. Um, you know, it, it definitely caught me off guard when I started getting hit up by trainers. 
like trainers that I never heard of and didn't know of. Some trainers who I do know of um, reaching out for how do I do this online? And, you know, something that I had been struggling with on my own and just kind of forging ahead, trial by fire and, and figuring it out. Suddenly that knowledge became valuable to help others. And I don't mean dog owners, but like other dog trainers who are trying to somehow do what they need to do to adapt. And it really helped me with how I serve my students because now I have to explain to a dog trainer, how do you instruct and coach somebody online? And there's a lot to it. Yeah. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of ethics involved. Ethic, I'm big on ethics and responsibility. You know, for example, aggression. Everyone's online asking about how to deal with aggression. I'll be damned if I give someone a step-by-step instruction on how to deal with an aggressive dog that I've never seen, that I've never met, the people I've never met. And like some people who aren't used to working online have the thought of that. Like there are some things that ethically, responsibly, we can't touch. Then there's other things that we can. And there's a whole separate world and skill set involved in transferring this knowledge in a productive and responsible and ethical way to a dog owner who's coming to you for help from across the country through a webcam. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I think what you said is, you know, pressure forcing things or get making things, you know, people come together. Like we've had this content for the online kind of program and modules that we're, we have up now for quite a bit, but we've been kind of like focusing our energy other ways. Uh, so we've had like hours of content kind of just sitting on a hard drive. Um, and then as soon as, you know, the Corona stuff went down, we're like, okay, well now your hands kind of forced and we have to figure out, you know, minor details and stuff, you know, with the, the website. Um, but Hey, that, that pressure made it get done. <laughs> it, oh, it's definitely. Up. Have you have you guys noticed like I noticed this one thing like when I started doing more online stuff because like now that's pretty much like my day. I've noticed like, it's <clears throat> helped me kind of like become more detail orientated as far as my explanation of things. And like for me, like I just wanted, like I said in like the thing I posted earlier is like, you know, we have like, you know, two like the behavioral gurus, like, you know, really articulate and like you have like the caveman, <laughs> like which is me, like as far as like how I like I say things, it's always really simple. And, you know, the one thing like my clients and like my even my guys always hate like that I say is like, it's easy, just do this. And, you know, that's the part like for me, it's like physically doing things is pretty easy like, to do it. But like the explanation of it is, you know, that's it's helped me quite a bit just become more detail oriented as far as like my conversation when I'm talking to people yeah. and like explaining these things. I, I agree. I think I think there's two like it's twofold, though. I think one is, you know being detailed and explaining that I th- and being able to explain what you want without being able to grab the leash and say, Hey, do this. Um, yep. The second like good thing that I see from it is that it also, I find um, when I'm doing online sessions with people and private sessions, I find that it makes that responsibility a bit more on their end. Like, Hey, this is your dog. I'm here kind of helping you through this process and what we're training on, but you have to focus. Like it's on you. I'm not just, training your dog for you. You're training your dog. I'm helping you train your dog. And I think it's much more of a clear picture when it's sitting on a webcam and helping someone through it than if you're actually there physically with them. I think that's one of the benefits. Yeah. Hell yeah. I mean, I even, I, I've even noticed this, like in my, like with my, you know, I have a a five-year-old, she just started school and then like her first year in school is like, obviously like halfway through it, they got to stop. I've even noticed like with that, just like, the, the learning responsibility aspect of it and like working and you know, working through it online without actually having to be like in front of a teacher where it's like, you know, accountability is right here. Boom, boom, boom. Like in front, you know, it, it's, it's changed the way that she's learned as well too. And like, I've noticed that with all of our clients, like, like now all of a sudden, like most of my online clients have, you know, much more engagement, <laughs> much more engagement with their dogs. Now that they're forced to focus on this thing, you know, especially with the, uh, you know, the working for their meals and like what Katie was saying earlier is that, you know, now they're forced to be around, you know, their dogs like all the time. <laughs> like you can't just be like, all right, they're going to go to the daycare or like, OK, they're in the kennel or the crate. I'll see you in eight hours. It's like, oh, you're here. Like <laughs> you're you're here all the time. Like this is what it is. Um, well, the other thing I was asking you is, like, have you noticed any any 
this is something I've been stressing to a lot of people. And like, Mike, I know you posted something about this uh, on the grassroots, but the uh, separation anxiety thing, you know, like with people being around their dogs consistently and constantly working, like that's one thing I've had to stress to my clients and be like, you know, I know you want to like continue to work with you, like your dog, like throughout the day, like some of the ones who are really eager, but I always like tell them like, okay, you got to create like a little bit of separation so they don't have, they don't, we don't build it. So I've noticed like that been a, been one of the, one of, being one of the big things that I've had to work on with my clients. Have you guys seen any of that? Well, for me, I know with my students, we do one of our exercises that I have them do when they get started is we do a lot of umbilical training, man. Like I have them tethering the dog to her waist and the dog is with them, following them. So I've already had to set in some safeguards for that into my curriculum anyway. So those principles, the, you know, the principle of being aware of how you're managing your time and that whole connection, it's already been embedded into what I'm teaching because I have to be careful of that with them because I'm having them make the dog follow them, make the dog be in their proximity. So with that in mind, we're also trying to balance this concept of teaching a dog how to be invisible, teaching a dog that they are not the center of the household universe. So they have to tether the dog to a piece of furniture and ignore it for 30 minutes. They have to create crate time anyway. So whether they're home now because of Corona or pre-Corona, it hasn't. Re I haven't had to make too many adjustments in my instruction because it was. It's already very um, integral content in the curriculum I'm already teaching. Because I got to be careful when you start tethering a dog to someone, you got to put that stuff in there. Yeah, because it could happen anyway. Yeah, yeah. So I, I kind of we made the post on grassroots. Not that we've been seeing it a lot yet, or, or issues with it happening. Uh, but we try to give our, our, our clients like the heads up, you know, and, and give them trying to be preemptive and stay ahead of it before it becomes a problem or potentially can become a problem. Just like, hey, make sure that you're you're still uh, building these boundaries and these safeguards around what's happening with your interactions with your dog right now. So giving them their time, uh, you know, away from their, time, their independent time and not letting them have expectations of if you're here, I'm with you. Um, the entire time so nice, nice. <clears throat> we've had um so i don't know if you guys probably seen some like the posts we have but i have like tie backs like in my in my house like for like my dogs to go like in their place commands i've lit i think i've literally probably i mean that's got to be like close to like two dozen people like look it i installed a tie back in my house like for my dog to go into its place command i'm like great <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> awesome yeah, All right. for you guys while we're talking about it on topic, what would you guys say to the to the, the pet owners that are out there watching us right now and they're hearing us talk about online training, online training? Let's, let's dig into that a little bit because, you know, as they're watching, there might be some people who are completely unfamiliar with the concept of working with a dog trainer online. I mean, the three of us are talking about it like, yeah, because we do it. And yeah, we have our students who are familiar with it, but I'm sure there's people watching now, people who will be watching later who are like, huh, online training. Um, and that's a, it's a sketchy world to let someone go into without any type of guidance. So what are each of your thoughts? And then I'll chime in after. Um, what are each, what would you say to someone who's like online dog training? What's that all about? As far as how could you caution them or introduce them to how they could go about looking into that if they, and it might be just because they don't have anybody in their area yeah i mean i also i'll basically like the way that i start off like with my online stuff is like there's specific guidelines as far as like what we're going to work on you know when it's a you know, when, when it's an aggressive because we get ton, I mean, behavior like behavioral issues like with aggression and everything like it's kind of like my bread and butter here like in california um and like some of the seminars we do but you know the big thing is i always get those like questions like can we help can we do this online i'm like well i can't help you like physically i can't read your dog you know through the screen i can try my best i can give you guidelines um on how to do things so what i do typically 
and like with all of my like online training classes, I just break it down as simple as possible. We go over dog management. We go over what is your dog doing throughout the day? What are you using as far as motivation? So we, you know, heavy into working for their meals, you know, what type of family structure, family hierarchy that you've established uh, and kind of break down these individual things and just kind of talk to them like, all right, cool. So your dog is possessive over your couch, but that's because you allow your dog on your couch all the time. Like take them, we'll take that away. We call it ground zero where it's like the control level of like, okay, cool. If they're not in the crate or on a place command, they're supervised or you have the leash on you. So we don't, like for me, like we use carabiners. Like I have people like, okay, hit the carabiner to your hip. And like, this is where your dog's going to be at. Like, this is where they're at. And if they're not going to be managed completely with you, they're not going to be in a place. They're not going to be in a crate, you know, then you like, then they're on the carabiner. So like there's three different ways of like managing that we, we, we start off with, especially online, especially with like what's been going on now. Uh, and then, you know, the, the one thing I was saying, like, even when I said before, um, you know, my instruction has to be more detailed now. <laughs> and like it has to be a little bit more communicative in the way that I say things to people. So I mean, there's obviously limitations like that I've learned, um, you know, doing online. Like you know, I can get to some fairly basic reactivity issues. I can get through some obedience. I can get through some other things. But for the most part, it's just kind of figuring out what always like what the issue is, and then kind of just giving them the baseline of what to do, and then try to help them as much as I can throughout the program. Uh, to get to their goals. But like you said, there's limitations uh, in certain aspects of things. Uh, and I would say even limitations, limit, limitations, it's more responsibilities in certain aspect of things. Like if I have a, a dog who's like been mauling the shit out of people, like I'm like, okay, like we probably, <laughs> this is probably something that needs to be done in person because I don't think I'm going to be able to like, you know, teach you how to handle those things uh, online. But you know, you can kind of get away with certain things when it comes to like the management and just switching up basic things. Cause a lot of times, you know, when you tell people like, Oh, like I said, like I mentioned the couch thing, like, Oh, my dog's possessive over this part of the couch. Well, well why the fuck is he on the couch? Like, like, <laughs> like, like, why, why, why are we allowing that? Like he's possessive over this bone. Like you gave him that bone. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what are, what are we doing? We got to take that away. But that's how my experience has been with everything. Yeah, I, I would say uh, if we're kind of cautioning, you know, it's a, it's a great tool, but uh, like anything else, it's also the internet. So there's going to be, unfortunately, a lot of garbage out there. Um, and you're going to need some kind of guidance to get through that, that garbage. One of the easiest things that I would recommend to people is, hey, if someone's offering you online training or online services, um, that person should probably also have quite a bit of free content that you, that's available for you to see and view um, and kind of go through on your own. Um, that's one thing that I would I would say. Uh, the other thing that I would recommend is you know, not even just with online content, just training in general. Like just be aware of like used car salesman types. Like if they're, if, if oh yeah, we can do that online, and I'm going to give you a behavioral guarantee that three sessions online your dog is going to be off leash trained and no longer wants to kill children like <laughs> anything that generally sounds too good uh probably is hey can you but, shoot you me know, the link to that because i want to sign up <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> me too um but you know view their content um if it is good um there should also be other people that have done it and can tell you, give you their feedback. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of good stuff out there uh, online. There's a lot of crap out there. Um, the final thing that I would probably like to, that, that I would recommend, if someone has problems explaining why they're doing something, that should be a huge red flag to you. Um, if it's just do this because that's how I do it, my recommendation would be, you know, look somewhere else. Uh, you you want to know why you're doing something. Oh, definitely. Like that's, and like, that's one of the things, like I always look at, um, like when, when people ask me about like social media, like how we use social media, um, I, I always say like, it's the resume, you know, it's the, it's the portfolio showing like the work that like, you know, we do and that I do, and um, like how, how we do things. Like, you know, that's one of the biggest things, like, you know, like you said, free content, um, and going there and like, I'm super guilty, like, especially when it comes to like explaining, like, like my why, like that's the one thing like I've, I've had to learn, like, a lot about in the recent years, like explanation as to why we do it, like, you know, as far as the functionality of it. But, you know, the one thing I've, I've learned, especially doing the seminars throughout like the United States now, is that like in California, like it's, 
it's so weird when you talk to somebody and try to explain certain things and all of a sudden it's just like they're smacking themselves in the head like they did like there's a block of just like trying to explain to you like the method and the theory as far as why this is happening and it's just like nope like <laughs> not, not going in anymore uh and then you know I've, I've done seminars in like minnesota or in the midwest and you know people just absorb that stuff just so much quicker so like that's been like one of the really cool things too just seeing like demographically and like just regionally you know how people absorb information and it, and and something like that's one thing that we learned like a couple of years ago when we were traveling around a bunch I was like man i was like you know depending on the area people absorb information quite differently it's pretty it's pretty interesting have you guys noticed anything like that well i mean i think isn't it like a third degree felony to use the word punishment in california yeah well, i'm pretty I sure I mean, I'm right. a felony bro like it's right away <laughs> You can't say correction or punishment. I mean, you, know, you can't say correction at all. <laughs> you get in the lies. <laughs> KD, what what would you advise? Um, you know, potential people that want to check out some online training. Man, I gotta say, like it, you summed it up, man. Like I don't know what I could add to that. That was pretty solid because it, it's. It's really just about making sure that people understand the same things that if you were to, if they were looking for a trainer in person, you know, there, there are certain things that they have to look for. Um, a big, you know, being able to answer questions is important, you know, and if they get mad at you for asking questions, like that's a temperament test right there. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, you know, if specifically, <laughs> now, folks, that'll be for the uh, behind the scenes, behind the curtain podcast. <laughs> um, but specifically, if they're online, then yes, I really like how you said look at their online presence because they better have some free content for you. Listen, if they're offering this service then there should be an ample amount of legitimate content showing you what is going on and letting you know what you can expect from that. Um, as you guys know, you know, Instagram is my home. I have Facebook because I have to, um, but my Instagram is my hub, right? So, you know, and I'll get questions. People want to see more videos of Elmo and I, the pit bull I got, or, the German Shepherd, like where I'm like, I'll put those videos up every once in a while to remind people, like, yeah, I know how to hold a leash. Um, <laughs> but my page is full of what? My students and their dogs. People that I've never met in person, dogs I've never touched, people who've never had a dog before, doing things with their dogs that I know some dog trainers that can't do. Like, look for some content that shows what their students are getting from the type of service that they're offering. Um, and everything else, I, I'm just co-signing on what you said because I completely agree with it. You know, be careful of the guarantees. Yep. And, you know, I've done a lot of research, not just in the dog training, but like how to present content online because I have a responsibility to make sure that what I put out and the content I put out is responsible and I'm not going to create more problems than I solve with what I put out there, whether it's free or whether it's in my online programs. And, you know, people that look at my guarantee, my contract, my agreement, you know, the only guarantee I have is that your dog will not be fully trained when we're done. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, I guarantee you the dog will not be done. And, you know, people will kind of look at me funny when I say that to them. I'm like, transparency? I mean, hello. Yeah. Like, I am yeah. not offering dog training services. I'm offering education and coaching for dog owners to train their own dogs. So look for, ask questions of whoever you're going to give money to and be careful of those guarantees that sound too good to be true. You know, I mean, other than that, man, you summed it up really well, Mike. I think like that's like, I mean, that's super, I mean, that's super important as far as like how you said the free content, you know, that's, that's right on, right on the money with that. And also the guarantees are, what do you say? Um, watch out for the used car salesman vibe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Do you guys want to get into 
some questions? I I think we we all got some good ones to share. Mm -hmm. All right, Katie, hit us with the first one. Oh, okay. Let me pull it up. All right. So, like you know, everyone watching, you know that all of us uh, put up a post on our Instagram because we wanted to get. You guys are followers, a voice in here. So the cool thing is, it's not just going to be me answering my people's questions. No, I want everyone to answer so that, you know, our people get to uh, be exposed to other perspectives. Um, let's see. And of course, we'll give you a little shout out too. Um, but all right, here we go. This is from Tempting Kate. She's not just one of my followers. She's also my K9 Blueprint program, so I'm super proud of her for asking this question. Um, what is the veterinarian's role in helping owners pursue dog training and behavior modification? Awesome question, Kate. Nesbeth, take a moment. Get us started, man. Yeah. <laughs> um. I think that uh, it, it's a, a vet's role to, well, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. Um, Take another drink. That'll help. This is, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think vets are, are an important aspect actually to helping owners get dogs trained that need training. Um, I think they have a, a, a very important role that if they deal with it responsibly um, could be vital uh to helping dogs i think a lot of times, uh, as a dog trainer I, I don't ask people to or, or recommend that people give their dogs certain medications because that's not my profession and i would never do that i think when vets outside of saying hey maybe get your dog some training start making specific training suggestions to owners and um we we all know that you know purely positive training it, it is a way to it's one of those used car salesman kind of vibes uh, yeah. and i think when it's much easier for a vet to tell someone hey you know just purely positively train your dog uh, because it's a safer answer to 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 clients for them for the vets like what responsibility they take on they're like hey i know that the public's opinion on this is the most are going to be okay um, I think a responsible vet should make recommendations, but also know what their limitations are as a vet. Um, the same way that if I see a dog that's super skinny, I say, Hey, there's a potential, maybe this dog might have some type of parasites. Maybe you should go see a vet. I'm not going to tell them, Hey, your dog has parasites and this is the medication that you need. Uh, but I will recommend them taking their dog to the vet to get the vet's opinion on it. The other thing that I, the other bone that I have to pick with vets is I think a lot of times a vet is really quick to prescribe medication for behavioral issues that don't necessarily need medication uh, because I, I don't know what their motivations behind it are. Maybe it's a, a sale. You know, I wouldn't like to think that because I, I would want them to be ethical. Uh, oh, and, you're so follow it. But, um, you know, I, uh, sometimes they make, you know, prescriptions and I was like, hey, we can work on this. This is just because your dog doesn't understand boundaries and, and these limitations to themselves. Uh, so that's kind of my my uh, vet answer. We'll pass it on to Mr. Jones, and then we'll let KD finish it. <laughs> so I have a, this is actually like one of like the, one of my biggest issues, uh, especially being out here, because like I think uh, like KD says, like, you know, correction or punishment is a bad word or a level three felony in California. Um, so I don't know how <laughs> many times I get like dogs in that are just so doped up just because the people don't want to use corrections and you know with the and especially like behavioral issues you know you see these dogs who are just basically like xanaxed out because you know they've been biting the owner or doing some of that and the vet's like well you know positive behavior or let's say the behaviorist um said oh we need uh you need to use medication you need to add this in here and use positive reinforcement only and like that's something that's extremely common uh, I, I posted i reposted one of the things that we we did a while ago where i was like if your vet recommends medication over training or has a specific style of training like positive reinforcement and medication, then you got to find a different vet. I mean, like for me, I have one of my best friends is a vet and he's the guy that we use. But like the thing that I've always like, we one thing I love about him is that 
you know, we stay in, like, we stay in our lanes. Like, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say, like, I can, you know, fix your dog's broken or torn ACL or anything like that. So, like, why would, and you're not going to say, like, you know, the behavioral aspect, I can fix your dog from trying to maul these kids and, like, you know, try, like, to kill this other dog. You know, so it's, like, kind of staying in the lanes. And, you know, the problem I always see is that the fact that the vets go immediately to medication. And, like, for me, like, that's not, you're not, you're not solving anything. You're just straight, like, I'm going to just dope this dog up, and that's what's going to be. So for me, like, I, I try to keep things as black and white, and that's just, like, how I communicate in general. Is it like, okay, cool. Like, I'm not a vet. I'm not going to help you with medical stuff. I'm going to teach you how to fix these behavioral issues and rehab this, you know, this issue with your dog. Um, I'm not going to go there and do surgery on your dog, but I'm going to help you train and go through these things. Um, and I think, like, that's the part that, you know, a lot of vets kind of overstep their boundaries is, you know, it's immediate to medication. And, you know, the one thing I've talked to some of the vets I have is like, you know, they do get these like quote unquote spiffs for selling medication and they do get these endorsements and they do get these money for, you know, for doing those things. And like, that's one of the, one of the bigger issues that I've, I've seen because I've talked to so many different trainers and people like just in my general area and, you know, they're quick to medicate, they're quick to euthanization if they don't fit the program of like positive reinforcement only, but that's, I think I see that more here in California than I've seen like in any other state that I've worked in uh, with our dog training is just that they're so stuck on this one format. And if it doesn't fit that format and it doesn't fit the medication, then it's like, okay, cool. Well, dogs, uh, dogs are danger. We're going to euthanize it. And that's one of the things that like, for me, it's like a, it's like a trigger stamp. And I'm like, your vet, go fucking do the medical shit of this. Like, you don't, <laughs> you don't need to be talking about the behavioral aspect or training or doing anything like that. Cause I mean, most vets I know that have dogs, you know, their dogs are pretty shitty so <laughs> when it comes to the obedience. So that's like the one thing I'm always kind of, I'm always just like when I, people ask me about it, I, I just, I just stay in my lane. I just tell the same thing. Like, you know, your best vet is a medical doctor. He's not a be not a real behaviorist or not really some a dog trainer. You know, he's just a vet and the, or they're just a vet in that aspect of things. Yeah. And I, I think sometimes I like, just to add in, like they, they might even be moving with like, ill intent i just think they're looking at things from like such a medical perspective that yep. they refuse to see things outside of that and it, obviously we're speaking in general terms you know i i have a vet that that i use that's awesome he's a punishment is what stops behavior if, if you need to stop a behavior you need to but like there's also those vets um but you know just in general terms i think a lot of times they get locked into medical like locked into this medical mindset and it's how can i solve this dog that has anxiety you know, dope it up. How can I, and it, instead yeah. of taking a step back from that. What's that, um, what's that term that like positive reinforcement people use all the time? Science, science, science-based training or something like that. Scientific. <laughs> Don't get me started, man. KD, yeah. that's a trigger word. You got your trigger word, man. It's like, it, 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 there goes it, the it, they feel bad when you correct them. Yeah, no shit. Like they feel good when you give them treats. Duh. Like, <laughs> All right, what do you got, KD? I see the, the look. <laughs> well, you know, if you got a problem with your hemorrhoids, you don't ask the fucking dentist for help. <laughs> you know, you know, you might want to, like, the proctologist should stick to the asshole, and the dentist should stick to the top end, where all the other shit comes out. You know, so when a veterinarian starts giving training advice when they had three days of PowerPoints of completely cultivated information, they they need to recognize their role. And, you know, I was listening to Mike warming up with the answer. And I'm like, okay, where, he's so polite. Where is he going with this? You know, <laughs> like, all right, Mike, let's see what you got. And um, he's like, I think they have a very important role, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah. It's called telling the person to go see a fucking trainer. You're not right. That's, that's important. Yeah, that's important. It's, it's an important role. <laughs> it's a really important role. And, and that's what the veterinarian's role is, is to be honest, be transparent, provide medical advice on anal glands and bowel impactments. And things you're, like you're that. stuck on the butthole right know, now, man. I was about to say the yeah. same thing. <laughs> because this is bullshit. He's really focused on the butt stuff, right? Yeah, because this topic is full of shit. So you know, I thought it was appropriate. 
you know, you know, you're, you're medicating dogs that haven't been trained. You're pacifying owners who, who are clueless and coming to you for true advice. Yeah. You know, I and, and Nesbeth was right. I, I mean, we do the same thing. I get veterinary questions all the time from my students. And I, I'm quick to say, whoop, yeah. talk to the vet. That's one for the vet. That's a question for the vet. And it, because it's not my place to make that type of assessment on something that, you know, I'm not clinically trained in. Now, yeah, I got years of hands-on experience touching and working with dogs. Great. Is there some medical stuff I know about a dog? Yeah. Is there stuff that the three of us would talk about offline as to how to solve problems without going to a vet? Yeah. Are we going to do that professionally, um, responsibly with our clients? I don't know. Yeah. So the vets need to follow suit. And, and for people watching, here's a great piece of free advice. If your vet starts throwing pills at your dog for behavioral problems, smile politely, pick them up, and leave. Yeah. And Kitty meant pick up your dog. Don't pick up the vet and leave. Just pick up your dog and get out of there from there. <laughs> well, <I> mean, <laughs> yeah, that's like, and that's like, that's one of the issues like I've had a lot with over here is that, you know, throughout the years is that because the dog, like they're a vet, they're a doctor, you know, all of a sudden, you know, their word is gospel to like these pet owners because they, you know, pulled a foxtail out or fixed a suture or did something. So like now, and like, this is the thing too, like even within dog training is that, like they're specialists in that one realm of the dog. They're not necessarily specialists in the all realms of the dog and like all things. Like even like in dog training, like you have people who are very good at specific things uh, and then people who are like, okay at other things. So it doesn't all tie back into the same stuff, but because, you know, they're a vet and they're a doctor, um, you know, it, it carries more value to them from what I've noticed. I um, mean, like that's been a big combative thing, but you know, exactly what you guys said. Well, when you go to your doc, when we go to our doctors, right? We go to a general practitioner. Yep. Like I, I, and you know, Jones, I know you, you can probably relate to this too. You get a sports injury. You don't go to the GP. No. <laughs> you know, when I get an injury from jujitsu, you know, the last, I don't want to go to my GP who deals with such a, a, a diverse assortment of injuries and nonsense they can barely scratch the surface at what you need like no i'm going to a sports orthopedic person or someone who deals with athletes or someone who's specializes in those type of injuries not someone who deals with like 80 year olds with bad hips like yeah. you know so yeah well, and, and it's the same thing as with the dogs there right if you go there with with that injury then they're probably just going to say hey here's these pills for the pain that you have or here's the pills for the anxiety that you're suffering from now right where it's kind of band-aid solutions. And again, there's a really small, small percentage of dogs that may need medical treatment for some type of something tied into behavior. Um, yeah. But it's so small that it, the number is like not even worth really mentioning. Uh, like training and at least begin and start training and see if those things are, are helping before you and uh, don't just start there with medication. I think that's the wrong move. Yeah. And, and I, I, I got to give a shout out here to uh, Don Tucker in Alabama, right outside of Huntsville, Alabama. Um, like to meet a vet, I, I, I met her at a seminar and have reached out to her numerous times. And, you know, when you meet a vet at a working dog seminar, like already it's like love at first sight. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, what's your name? You know, um, and you know, I, I have to give credit where credit is due. And, and people listening to us have to realize there are excellent veterinarians out there who would who would agree with what we say and who would be quick to tell us to keep our mouths shut when it comes to medical stuff. The same way we're doing it for them. Those vets are out there. They are out there. And like I said, shout out to Don Tucker. Um, you know. It just finding them, and for those those pet owners out there watching, you know that that's what we're hoping that we can help you do is give you some tools to be able to find a good vet, some diagnostic tools. Like if you hear this, you should be concerned. If you hear this, maybe you should ask some other questions because there are really good, responsible vets out there 
who do take that role very seriously of being able to defer something that's out of their expertise somewhere else. You just got to find them. And, and when you do find them, hold them dear and close because that's what yes. hold it. Hold them. We have our vet that we use and that's, that's where we'll continue to use um, because they're, they're hard to come by. So when you do find them, keep them close. Like the same thing, same thing with dog training. When you, <laughs> when you find the good ones, you, you stick with the good ones. Exactly. All right. So here we go. All right, Mike, do you have any questions? Yeah, I have a, a question that's from um, Pink Boy Bruno. It's it's um, dog aggression versus dominance. What is the difference in terms of mentality? Okay, do you want to go up first on this one? Yeah, I'll start out by saying most people, like we, we got to define what the hell dog aggression is. Like yeah. right off the bat, as soon as I hear that question, it's like, okay, <laughs> Vocabulary lesson, like people, my perspective, my current position, I'm very, I like to use those words because it leaves me a way out tomorrow. Um, so, you know, when I hear dog aggression, I only use that term in the context of a dog that just sincerely and purely has a desire to engage in combat with another dog just for the fuck of it. Right. To me, that's dog aggression. And to me, a lot of dogs get labeled as having dog aggression when they don't have they're not dog aggressive. Um, you know, when you see a dog with true dog aggression, it makes the hair stand up in the back of your neck. If you've never seen it before, you're like, whoa, that's something different. Like he looks happy, <laughs> but really angry at the same time. What's going on here? Um, he's salivating. Why are his pupils so big? But his tail's wagging. <laughs> You know, as opposed to a dog who's scared, a, talk, a dog who's frustrated, a dog who's insecure. Um, so if we're going to, you know, move forward, dog aggression as a dog just desire to just destroy another dog compared to dominance. Well, you know, dominance is, you know, we can go into state of mind slash dominant state types of behaviors, um, you know, the way it would, I would see it manifest itself differently is a dog who's trying to exercise dominance. That's hierarchy-based behavior. That is a dog trying to say, I'm more important than you. All these resources are mine. Fuck you. Um, and after any type of squabble or violence that is used to establish that, it it's going to stop. I mean, it, it's just purely to assert a position or to communicate an idea. Like, you ain't shit. And that's what the dog's trying to say. Whereas dog aggression, I mean, get a break stick. Like, I mean, it's, they're, it's not stopping. Like, the, the dog isn't trying to assert anything. The dog's trying to get one off. And that's how he's going to get it. Yeah, I think, um, it's like I deal, <clears throat> so I deal with a lot of, like, issues like that. You know, reactivity and aggression and all those other things. But I always blanket statement in the matter of, like, you know, when we talk about like impulse control and everything. So the understanding, like no matter what uh, it is situational, if I'm walking across the street and my, the dog is like actively wanting, you know, real dog aggression where, you know, their tails up, they're excited, they're moving forward, but they want to get to this dog just to purposely fuck this dog up. That's still not something that's allowed. Whereas, you know, if a dog is dominant and be like, get the hell out of here or like, you know, possessive or, or territory, you know, the same thing uh, when they have that reaction, you know, immediately for me, like, I'm just like, okay, cool. You can't have that reaction. Like, this isn't something that we can, you, this is not an allowed behavior. Or like, you know, Katie was saying, like, you know, with ranking, you know, sometimes, you know, the dogs, you know, especially my house, you know, I have eight dogs, um, six of which are, you know, active protection or protection prospects uh, and dogs who are like, you know, they're basically, they walk around like their shit doesn't stink, you know, <laughs> very egotistical in that manner. Um, and I don't allow uh, a lot of ranking in my house. Like there's no, like for example, for, for example, the way I put to my clients, I'm like, okay, like, you know, the people are here, the dogs are here. There's no real, like this type of thing. It's just right away. Like that's just the guidelines that I lay out for them. Um, just because I just don't allow that level of ranking for them. I don't want them to make those decisions, uh, when it comes to like the dogs in the house or even dogs outside, like, you know, it's all neutral in that, in that 
aspect of things, you know, with real like dog aggression. Um, I, I work a lot of impulse control with that because I did, like, I started my training, you know, years ago, uh, dealing with a bunch of rehab cases and dealing with like, you know, mostly it was like pit bulls and chihuahuas uh, in the area that I was in. And, you know, you see like a lot of that natural genetic, you know, the American pit bull terrier style of like, where it's like, uh, I want to get, I need, I need to get there. I need to get like, this is like just something like, it's the same thing when you talk about like mouths, like well grips and like Dutch's with those things, like genetic traits and inclinations, you know, like that's the same thing that I've seen with them. You know, my dog, Marilyn, you know, she's a, she's, she's a feisty little, little shithead. Um, but you know, with her, like, it's still, you can see it. Like she's just looking and she wants, she knows she has to control herself. She knows, she knows she has to be like, Man, I can't go over there. So I work a lot of engagement. We work a lot of engagement with her, but she's still like, I still want to fuck you up. Like it's still inside and like, I still want to like destroy you. So for me, I, I look at it a lot of impulse control. So I don't really break it down to the reasons why I just let them know the reasons why they can't do those things. Um, whether it's a genetic thing, whether it's, you know, dominance, um, you know, like for us, like I have, you know, my house, we have Zilla, Ozzy and Cerberus, um, both, you know, pretty dominant males. And, you know, Ozzy is probably the most dominant one uh, coming in. And we have Samson who we just brought in. Uh, we talked about him and, you know, him and him, like he's, you know, he walked in and Ozzy's like, nah, fuck you, dude. <laughs> like, who, the, who the fuck are you? And why are you, why is my, why is my handler holding, like, why, why is this happening? So you see the difference, like as far as like the ranking, but it's still stuff that we just don't allow, like in our own, uh, like our own household. And that's stuff that I tell like all of our clients too, because you know where we are, where we live, everyone's really condensed, uh, and everyone's really like on top of each other as far as like where housing is and everything. So all the time I tell my clients, I was like, you know, I was like, well, we don't. That's not a behavior we want, right? Okay, cool. Then we correct that behavior. We focus more on the engagement, creating that social neutrality, uh, and creating like social etiquette too. Speaking of Ozzy, there he goes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think like my opinion on it um, is you know, dog aggression. It again, it goes to the terms. Um, you know, for me, dog aggression is something that's there, uh, and that intent behind that dog isn't going to change. You know, we we can kind of you know manage it, but yep. that's going to be there. Dominance, uh, and, and specifically in regards to other dogs. Uh, you know, I, I think is also just part of a natural communication between dogs. You know, you see some dogs that um, will be a little bit more dominant to dogs that aren't showing the right behaviors while they're in gate, like playing with one another. Um, I, I think that part of it needs to be, you know, like that's way that they can communicate with one another. Um, but all, all in all, I think that they, they're two separate. They can be two separate things and usually they are. And more than likely, um, you probably haven't seen what true dog aggression is. You're probably seeing reactivity or, or, or something, something other than true dog aggression. More than I may be wrong, but more than likely, that's probably what's going on. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that, too, a lot of people I don't think have seen true dominance. That as well. Yeah. You know, even more so. I see all the time people use the word, I have a dominant dog. Oh, my dog's the alpha of my pack. And oh, I'm not like, okay, you're you're forbidden from using that word. Um, <laughs> I'm taking that word and putting it in out. No more alpha for you, sweetheart. We're, we're going to talk a little bit. Um, because they don't, like, you, they don't get it. Like, yeah. the, the words alpha and, and dominance and, like, your dog is not around. Yeah, you they just throw around. around a lot. <laughs> you have a dog who senses a vacuum in the leader in the leadership in the home, and it's kind of stepping up to the plate to feel things out. That doesn't make it a dominant dog. If you well, that's to... that's one thing I wanted to chime into, like that too. Is like a lot of that stuff I've seen just with the amount of dogs that we've trained and we work with. I mean, all that stuff is created. You know, like the dominance and the hierarchy and the ranking, like it's created by the owner. Like kind of what like Katie said, like. Well, this one's the alpha in you know in my house. I'm like, no, <laughs> no. Like, and if he's having these issues, like I let him do this. I'm like, well, that's why he's doing that because you're allowing this, you know, social this hierarchy issue. Like, you're causing you know a lot of rank stuff. And like, I, I see that you know, especially like you know that 18 month to three year age range when they go through that ranking drive. You know, a lot of that stuff when they start pushing and starting to develop and come into those things, like you see a lot of these issues just pop up. And I'm like, a lot of that is loud, uh, allowed. And you built that because you had that mindset like, well, he was here first. This is the dog I want to. 
you know, be here. Like, so you're causing those things and dogs being, you know, those packed animals, you know, they're going to continuously test and it's going to continuously build. So the allowance of ranking and allowance of, you know, showing dominance, allowance of doing all these things is going to create this big episode. And like, that's well, you know, all my clients, people who come to me, they're like, well, all of a sudden one day, you know, Fluffy just mauled the shit out of Scruffy. And now we've, <laughs> now we're, now we're at the bed. I'm like, forgot, you forgot the other, it was out of nowhere. Out of, out of nowhere. nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He just turned. Yeah. Out of nowhere. Hey, I, I got to run and take a piss break. You guys continue. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> so we now we're on the bottom end of the human scale. We talked to KD about pooping. And now we're, you know, talking about peeing with um, what <laughs> has been there. It's what he gets for drinking that cheap beer. The, the death beer. The Coronas. Oh, my God. Dude. But like, that's one thing that I've, I've ran into a lot, like, you know, especially when when we talk about like, you know, natural aggression, uh, natural, you know, dog aggression in general, and like, you know, what it is and natural dominance. You know, I think a lot of what we see now is at least what I see on my side is, you know, the dominance for the most part, you have dogs who are dominant, but I think a lot of it is allowed and it's created. Whereas, you know, when you deal with, you know, aggression, you know, natural aggression, you know, that stuff that is genetically in there, like kind of what Mike was saying uh, is that, you know, a lot of it is it's you can manage it and you can create impulse control. But will that dog always have that level of trigger? I mean, it's the same thing as people. Some of us are going to be a little more aggressive than others. And it's in, in the genetic code of, in that sense. So, I mean, it's learning how to communicate and control those things. Well, the whole topic, you know, of understanding hierarchy and dominance, you know, it, the, listen, Really good working dogs wouldn't be so expensive and breeding programs wouldn't be working their balls off for years, for decades to create dogs with a genetic profile where they think they are the biggest, fattest creature on earth. Like yep. if alpha dogs were so common, departments and dog brokers wouldn't be going through so much to try to find a dog that truly feels it's superior. So then what is it that all these pet homes have? Well, they have dogs. And that's the thing about understanding a dog and where, you know, and I, I go over this, we get into it. And I talk about dominance theory, where it came from, it's debunking and all of the misunderstandings and misinformation about some very real things. And the way I like to explain it is this, all of us, well, most people have had jobs other than what they do now. Uh, you know, it's like if you're in sales and you got like the lead salesman on the team, he gets promoted to sales manager. Well, just because he was a good salesman doesn't mean he's going to be a good sales manager, right? Those are two completely different skill sets. And I'm sure, you know, switch the job role to whatever floats your boat, you know, whoever's, you know, to you watching. Um, but if you've ever worked for someone or witnessed somebody get it, I hope you washed your hands, Nesbeth. Um, <laughs> Didn't have time. Um, you know, someone who gets a promotion for reasons other than being a good leader, we watch how they fail. They either become really permissive and they, they suck as a leader or they become tyrants because they can't handle the pressure. Listen, that's where the majority of dogs are. They are in a situation where they have been given a promotion that they weren't qualified for. And that's through the owner just not knowing. There's a leadership vacuum. The dog has not been given guidance. It's not that the dog wanted to be in charge. It's that they're programmed for survival to, if no one else is making good decisions for them, they will absolutely make their own. That yeah. doesn't make them an alpha dog. It doesn't mean they wanted that job. It means they got a promotion they shouldn't have gotten. And they mismanage that job. They don't know how to do it. So they either become super skittish, super nervous, hyper aggressive, hyper vigilant. Um, all these things come out. And then the person's like, oh, well, he's dominant. No, you're just permissive as fuck. And you allowed this to happen. It's, I, it's like to tie into that, like with the, like we talked, you know, we said basically that's, that's all allowed and like whatever, like the owner does is what creates these behaviors. You know, the one thing that I, I always talk to like my clients about, it's always like, okay, 
you know, that's they say like, oh, you know, I just let him be a dog. I just let him be a dog. I just let him do this. I'm like, you know, what is a dog? You know, these dogs were bred to be dependent on us, bred to be biddable. We have all these things that we want them to do. And this is why we created them for all these things. But when you go into that aspect of like thinking like, oh, hey, they're a wild animal. Let me do what the fuck they want. You know, they're going to make their own decisions. And typically, if a dog makes its own decision, it's probably not going to be the best decision. Um, and you're probably not going to like what happens from there because they are going to go into that that state um you know and that's like what you know we always talk to them about i was like you know they they crave that guidance they need that structure they need that understanding you know that levels the levels of freedom on which we think that they need especially out here you know it is it's very much like i would say overestimated uh and as far as like you know what they can do and what they can't do so that, that's like one of the things like i always talk like talk to our clients about I'm like you know it's like no it's like you create the structure you create your hierarchy you create your what it is like, you know, you know, you're here, dogs are here. Like this is exa exactly how it should be. Cause then you get those people that are like, well, you know, he's the alpha of the pack. Like, like what you were saying, KD. And I'm like, like, no, just stop it. <laughs> he's just a dominant dog. I'm like, no, just stop it. Awesome. Um, so much fun with that one. It's your turn, isn't it? Yep. So I'm trying to cycle through these things cause we got a bunch of them, but I think this is a pretty important one considering you guys all have your own businesses uh, in, you know, in dog training and successful with it. Um, so from yours truly unpredictable is what would you recommend for to a dog trainer opening their own dog training business? Hey, can, can you repeat one. that again? Can you, can you repeat it again? Just broke So this is uh, what would you recommend to a dog trainer? It's basically a young dog trainer that's trying to open up their own business. That's um, I, I'll start it. I go. think without without knowing who who it is, um, that question is going to be really hard to even answer. Uh, because what I see with young quote unquote dog trainers is like that's a that's subjective. Like, what is a young dog trainer? What it means that you're you're new to this? What means that you've been in for in it a long time? We've had countless amount of people uh, come here. Uh, to apprentice and learn under us for a month and a half and then go away and, and open up their own dog training business. Like if they consider themselves a young dog trainer that just got started or so it, it's really hard to pinpoint without saying like, Hey, what do you know? You have to be realistic with yourself. What can, yep. if, if I'm not comfortable in creating behavior and, and reliable behavior and instructing people how to do that, um, I'm not comfortable to take someone's money and to do that. If someone, I, I can't have someone pay me um, if I, I, I don't have the information or, or the ability to, okay, I know that, you know, step one is this and step two is that, but that's, we, all three of us know that there's no step one and step two, like yeah. it's going to change. So just because you've done it with two or three dogs before that fourth dog is going to give you a run for his money. Right. You have to first and it is huge on this. You have to understand the principles of behavior and, and how you apply those principles are going to be different per each, you know, per dog. There's going to be. But if you understand the principles and theory behind things, then you can start moving into, you know, opening up, uh, depending on again, like I can't really answer, give like a hard, solid answer and say, hey, you know, do this. That's kind of that's that's how I would go about it. What do you think, Katie? No, I mean that's that's good answer again, man. Like I agree with you. It, it's you, you know, and maybe to phrase it differently. Accept. There's a number of things you have to accept, and I think probably the first thing is that you need to be a student for the rest of your damn life. No. I don't, you know, accept the role of student and the teachers are going to be dogs and hopefully other seasoned, you know, proficient older people who will tell you when you're fucking up. Um, you you got to surround yourself with that type of mentality and those type of people because, you know, it's real easy to say what people should have before they go, before they become a professional. It's easy for each one of us to give three completely different perspectives on the criteria that we would want to see before someone takes a penny. But I think that's horseshit. We can't do that. That's not right. 
because everyone's got to start at some point. Everyone's got to pull the trigger and take that first dollar. And I, I'm not going to judge somebody on making that leap. I will judge them on what they're wearing when they make that leap, though. You know, okay, you, you're going to jump in, and, and sometimes you, we all know that the best teacher is going to be the dogs, right? And and I'm big on principles and theory. I, I, it's essential. But, the, you know, the rubber's got to hit the road at some point. And then you got to get out there and grab a shit ton of leashes and see a shit ton of dogs. So once if someone's going to make a job out of it and there's let's say there's no one else around in the area and they're like, you know what? I've trained some dogs. Let me try this. That's fine. Remember, you're always learning. Be honest as hell with yourself, let alone your clients. Realize your limitations, and the only way you're going to know your limitations is if you somehow can connect with some honest folks who are going to remind you of them constantly. Um, man, like pace yourself, pace yourself, and be careful with the damn social media. Um, it's it's screwing everything up. Don't do stuff for the Instagram. Do it for the damn for the dog in front of you. Um, Man, it's hard to say anything else beside that, Vinny, because things are so different now than when all three of us picked up a leash for the first time. Yeah, I, 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 and along the lines, I, I think there's just two that, like, you don't want to wait too long, and you don't want to go too early. You know, don't suffer from information paralysis and just there's so much for you to take in that you're never going to hold a leash um, because you can continue to read books and listen to podcasts for the rest of your life, and you won't make it 25% through the information. Um, you know, get the basis of what you need and then, you know, time on, time on the leash is, is pretty much what you'll do. If they're, if you're lucky to have people around you, even if the style that they train isn't what you like, you know, go, go in, and, and if they'll have you out, there's things that you'll pick up. I promise you'll take something away. They'd be like, Hey, I really like that. Or you're also going to take some, Oh, I'm never going to do that. Or that's not for me. Um, get out there. And, and that's how I would kind of guess. Yeah, I mean, it's like the one of like the like the cool things like I like this I like talking to you guys about um, is that you know when I first started training dogs, I had no understanding of four quadrants. I had no understanding of you know theory and behavior. I just kind of understood like associative based behavior. And this is when I was like thirteen or something like that, and I was working like in rescue. So I understood like, oh hey, the dog likes to sit, he gets food, or like you the dog wants to go and attack this dog. I correct, and like you go from there. Like you learn and you. I started with a lot of hands-on right away. Um, and then when I went into like Schutzen, for example, I found a mentor who would actually work with me. Um, and it was just like all force yanking, cranking, like and seeing like the different perspectives and thought processes there. I was like, this is completely different than the other one. So like, I kind of, I learned through my mentorship and just seeing like, you know, the people that I've worked with and the dogs that we're, they were working with and just kind of seeing all these different dogs and like how they communicated and, you know, I mean, before I even started Primal Cannon, I probably, I mean, I, I, saw, I saw thousands of dogs. Um, and, you know, like the big thing for me, like even before I even understood, like the, I would say the, the theory and like the behavioral stuff like that, like understood like the, the actual textbook versions of it and, you know, all that stuff. I had touched so many dogs already that I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Like, that's what that, that's what that means. Like, this is what that means. Like, this is why they did that. But it was just so much natural stuff that I worked with. So, I mean, I think... If you're looking at the end to dog training, obviously you want to use uh, you want to use as much educational information out there. Um, but I mean, I always tell people like you know find a mentor that you like their style, learn from them, work with them, put your hand like have them guide you. Put you know put your hands on leashes. Make sure you're doing the right thing before you even start thinking about taking money from anything. Um, you know, don't do no what's that fucking bullshit college uh, ABC is it? Oh. it? <laughs> like, what? But don't don't <laughs> don't go on to that motherfucker and start all of a sudden I'm gonna start training dogs like because there's it, it, I do believe that there's a certain you can know everything mentally you can understand everything on the education level as far as like you can read a book but can you actually write a book you know type of a thing like can you actually put those things down together um, so I mean for me get some hands on and learn you know learn a method that you like continue like Katie said you know continuously learn I mean for me like I. You know, I soak up as much information as I can on a daily basis uh, from any trainer I can possibly talk to and work with. And, 
you know, go from there. But yeah, I mean, for me, it's always going to be find a mentor, learn, learn how they do that, put your hands on a leash as much as you can, uh, and then continuously learn. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add in to what you said um, about the theory. And like when you first started off, you know, not necessarily understanding, you know, specific theories, uh, which is cool. Like I, I my story is a little bit different because I, I went to school for psychology without the intent of becoming a dog trainer specifically. Oh, yeah. um, so I, I kind of had like a jump start on the theory. Um, but I think regardless, like in the, you know, it's 2020, but having as a dog trainer, having an understanding of theory and, and how it's applied um, is extremely important. One for problem solving, but also two, we know like you're in California. And, you know, it's a third degree felony, you said, to yeah. use the word correction. Um, so when, when we're able to articulate ourselves and explain the full theories, not just little fragments of the theory, um, it, it also doesn't, it, it, get, it arms us with the information to be able to say, hey, this is why I train this way. This is, it's supported by this. And I, I'm able to explain the pieces of theories that, purely positive trainers are, are nitpicking at and, and yep. it, it, you can articulate that and it and it i think it's just better for the industry and as a whole if, if all of us are able to say hey look this is why i'm doing it this is you know that there can be sessions or you know a, a 10 second clip of a 15 minute session that makes a trainer look the best most fair trainer in the world end up looking like a dirt bag yeah right just because that there, there's not a perspective in what happened in that that full training session, right? If we have if we're armed with the ability to hey explain what's happening, um, you know the people that actually want to listen. Some people are not going to listen no matter what you say, no matter how much proof you have. Uh, it doesn't matter to them. But the one that are on the fence and are using ration and reason, um, you're able to talk to them through things. It's one of the reasons I don't really when I see kind of sketchy things posted online. I think if someone's a dirt bag, then yeah, that should be information for hey, that, <laughs> that person a dirt bag. But when there's these little like, you know, clips of something that happened, I'm like, I want to see like, what's the, what, what happened here? What like, to be able to, to you know, make an opinion or have an opinion on, on what's going on. Um, that's kind of just my my like i just added in a little bit about the theory why i think it's also important other than yeah. just training. i mean i think it's i think it's thing. so now like you know we've i've been doing this for a little while and primal canine is what it is and like now we have like this whole thing and like but there's a joke like so aaron who's like my girlfriend is the manager of like primal canine you know she's a psychologist and like when we first met like it was lit, like we she talked about like the quadrants and everything like that like for a second there i had to be like the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, 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 what? I don't, I don't understand that. She's like, and like, I, I just thought like, because when we talk, when you talk to positive reinforcement people, especially when these like, you know, science based training and all this other shit, I was like, I was like, it doesn't make sense because like, you know, obviously, like, as people, like, we have consequences for our actions. So why is everything going to be consistently positive? Like, obviously, if I do this, I get a positive reaction. That's great. Cause like, for me, like, I'm an associative based learner just in general. Like it's how things go like with me so i was, I was like I, when we started talking about it she started educating me on it i felt like it definitely you know helped me understand how to deliver that information better and articulate those words like articulate that better versus before like when i would talk to people i'm like well you know when you you fuck about your work like what do you think is going to happen like you're going to get in trouble right like or you know you do something good you're going to continuously get this and like you know the removal of you know food and all this other stuff i would just kind of I, without you know trying to sound too cheesy with that I, I just learned in the most primal manner of doing things but i having that like uh, education helps you know describe quite a bit so i think i was like you know i think eric stambro like he said it perfectly like in one of my lives is like it's you know it's absolutely it's necessary for a dog trainer to understand what this stuff is uh, understand theory understand like the actual behavioral things so they can describe it and kind of arm themselves with it um but like for pet people like they just got to understand like actual idea of like okay like cool they they, they messed up no <laughs> like we had a, you know they did good good job and then go from there but i mean i think it's a it's really interesting especially like talking to you guys because like i said in like that post is like you know i got the the behavioral gurus here who understand all these things and 
can articulate things in a, in a way that, you know, I can, I don't, I don't think I'll ever be able to, because it's always going to be a, you know, caveman stuff for me <laughs> in that manner. I have faith in you. <laughs> me too. Uh, always trying, always trying. All right, kid, you got another question? Yeah, 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 yeah. I got other questions. I got a whole bunch. Um, but all right, so okay, here we go. Um, from Mary, Mary, another one of my blueprint students. Um, she says, "Would love to hear your views on what pet owners should look for in a dog versus a working dog owner." Mike, you can grab that one. <laughs> uh. All right, I'm gonna. I'll just make some assumptions to make answering the question easier. Um, obviously, working dog can be a pretty broad term. Uh, you know, when you like working bite work. Um, just make it easy. The type of bite, you know, bite work. You know, whether it's sport. Right. Or, you know. All right, I'll do, I'm gonna do police specific because I look for there something different in a sport dog. Um, so I think for a, a pet owner. And for a working dog owner or, or want to be owner, you should yeah, first, before you even go life. look for a dog, is, um, you know, establish a criteria of what your ideal dog would be. Have a, write a list out, an actual list. Um, I would also get some help from a professional uh, and literally go through that list and, hey, what things can we test for in puppies or in, in an adult dog um, that meet this criteria? So if you want a calmer dog um, as a pet, that's not going to be super rambunctious uh a dog that's going to be have a soft mouth and not really like, those are genetic things that we can look for um even in establishing a breed um for a, a police dog specifically same thing we've defined a criteria um you know i i want most dogs wash uh, don't get selected um in police work for environmental issues so you know slippery surfaces um dark room stuff so that's the first thing that i'll test for before I get to anything else. Um, if they don't do well there out of drive and unassisted, we just move on. Um, if they do do well in that, uh, the next thing I test for is hunt. Um, so hunt, I want them to, you know, use their nose and be unassisted and hunt independently and away from the handler. I don't want them to keep running back and checking in like, oh, I didn't find it yet. I want them to just go and hunt until they find it or the world ends. Like that's when the hunt stops. Uh, and then finally, uh, bite work, again, depending on the age of the dog, it would change a little bit. Uh, but gen generally, I want to see a dog that's biting with a full mouth, um, is confident in that biting, uh, is not looking for assistance again from handler or, or any type of, you know, assistance from the decoy during the testing phase. Um, that's generally, you know, uh, for, as far as police and sport dogs, one thing that I really want in a in a police prospect is I want that dog to be super independent where I don't think for a sport prospect, it's generally as important. Um, you know, I want them for police work to be able to range way out and, you know, go hundreds of yards away from the handler um, and be totally fine and not check back in with the sport dog. I don't find that that's super important. You kind of want them to be engaged with you uh, for most sports, I would say uh, the entire time or the majority of the time. Um, and, and then one other thing that I test that I, I don't know if a lot of people test is for uh, recovery time. Um, so even with puppies, I test it. I, I want them to feel uncomfortable about something. It's like I don't punch a dog in its face and, and see it. I just want them to get uncomfortable, you know, uh, some, with a puppy, you know, kind of get it, hold, just not, not to hurt it, just hold its paw for a second until it tries to pull it away. And then, you know, not applying pressure to make pain just to clear it up before anyone goes crazy. Um, and then, you know, let go of their, their paw and put them down on the ground. Uh, and I want to see what they do. Do they decide at that point to take off and get the hell away from the weird guy that was just holding my leg oddly? Or are they like, whatever, I don't care. And, you know, go on with life or come back to engage with me. Um, so I think recovery time is an important thing with a pet or a working dog, uh, because you're going to make mistakes as the handler. You might be training your puppy and accidentally step on his tail and, you know, if we can have them a little bit resilient against those kind of things, um, you know, we, we avoid putting baggage on these dogs for the long run. That's kind of. Oh, definitely. I think like that's a, 
like for me, like I, I deal a lot more like in the personal protection uh, and like sport world when it comes to protection dogs. And I deal with tons with, you know, puppies and, you know, for pets and everything like that. Now with all the you know people we train, especially now, like everyone's been buying dogs and everything's been going on there. I mean, so for me, like I'm looking more for like the personal protection dog, the sport dog. I'm looking for like that, the bit ability, the dog that wants to please and wants to work and do all those things. Also looking at how do they respond to loud noises? How do they respond to slippery surfaces? And this might be repeated information because I had to go take a piss while uh, yep, <laughs> Mike was talking, but um, how they respond to you know, loud noises. Uh, are they skittish of certain environments? You know, how do they feel like when they're lifted upside down and all these other things, are they engaging? Um, you know, with, with protection dogs, I like dogs who are going to be a lot more confident and forward. Um, I don't necessarily look for that like complete forward aggression, like the dogs that are biting me in the leg when I have like a litter of dogs, like those dogs are cool, but I'm actually more interested in the dog that's actually looking for the ball too, when it comes to that as well, just to see like those dogs are a little bit, in my opinion, a little more easier to train um, when we work for that. Um, and Cause like I, I started when I was working dogs, like I was building dogs up. I never really got like really superior genetic dogs until, you know, whatever, 10 years ago. So I built a lot of dogs who maybe weren't, weren't like what would be someone's pick. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, I'm gonna build this dog to be this. And I just worked through the kinks. So like the way that I view things is a little more skewed because I'm like, I didn't see like the superior genetics right away. So I was like, oh, cool. Like I'm just gonna build this dog to be this way uh, and work with them. So I took more time in that way. Um, whereas now- like, You learn a lot at, more though. Yeah, man. Like now I just look at puppies. <laughs> I look at dogs. I'm always like, well, I mean, I can, I can make that dog work. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, like, and like, that's like the thing, like for me, like, like, it's just something like, I, could, I mean, we, we all know, like, Nino, for example, like, you know, Nino Duarte, um, STSK9, like, he's you know, a good friend, but he's, he's very selective because he's a specialist in what he does. And, like, for him, like, you know, he'll wash dogs out. Like, for me, like, I'll look at dogs and, like, we can make that work. But idealistically, what I look for in the dog is, you know, that, that outward confidence, you know, when they come off the airplane or when I go visit the thing. Like they're not like, you know, tail tuck running around like they're scared. Like I want them to be like, you know, what Mike was saying, like resilient and just being like bouncing back. Like, oh, hey, cool. Like if I screw up from from the back, like just to put them up, put them up and put in the kennel or put them in the car. Like they're not running away from me. They're kind of just back next to you. Like, oh, like or just sitting there like nothing happened. And I want the the puppies that we get to just really just not give a shit and not give a fuck about anything like that's going on with them. Um, you know, when it comes to environmentals. You know, when I look at like the way that they view like the the new place when we come home or like when we go into the facility, like when they go on to slippery services, when they go into Home Depot, you know, if they're like, what the fuck is this? Or if they're just like, I don't care, you know, and like that's essentially what I look for, like in all of like the dogs. So we do a raise and train program here, too, where we'll raise, put, we'll raise pets for people and then give them, you know, give them to them like, you know, five months into it after they're, you know, two months with us or whatnot. So we'll always look for that confident dog who, you know, is resilient. Uh, doesn't really care the nerves are there and just you know is biddable and wants to actually listen and you know work with work for the person but you know we you know that's more of like the dependent side because we don't you know focus too much on like law enforcement you know we get like maybe like one or two of those a year um with you know with the request or you know if i'm doing decoy work and we'll you know sell them that way we don't deal on that we don't deal in that volume but you know personal protection dogs i'm always looking for that you know real secure dog um, cause we've gotten dogs before from, you know, other vendors. I won't ever mention someone's name in this way, but we've gotten puppies and, you know, right out of the plane and they come out of the crate and they're just fucking, they're scared as shit. They're trying to bite everything. I'm like, well, I can't do anything. And they're not biting things like in prey. They're like, I'm biting because I'm terrified or just because there's this genetic thing going on. And I'm like, well, can't sell you. So <laughs> you gotta, you gotta go back <laughs> where it came from. But yeah, no, it's for me, it's always, it's always, I always look for that really strong, consistent, you know, um, nerve uh, threshold and having them under, like, be confident in everything. And then when it comes to like bite work, and I look at the dogs who are going to hold, it's, you know, with puppies, depending on age they are, you know, I always look at like where they hold uh, their initial rag when they're chasing it, um, if they're pulling back right away or if they're digging in right away, like, as you can see that at a pretty young age, um, or at least I've seen it at a pretty young age, and then just seeing like how they respond to certain things. Um, that's pretty much it for me. Thoughts, gentlemen? You know, it's almost kind of like buying a house, right? When I bought my first house, my realtor was like, all right, you got to make a list. I don't know shit about buying houses, man. 
you know, <laughs> process. I'm like, listen, for what? He's like, what do you like? So we looked at a couple houses and, you know, then I started to get it. He's like, well, he, well, for me, he started noticing I'd go right to the backyard, right? I'm always looking at the backyard. I can put a kennel over here. I can take shit over here. I can train over here. He's like, all right, so we need to put on your list for your house that that's important to you. And, you know, <laughs> whether it's the pet owner or, you know, and that's why I got a house with really obnoxiously small freaking bathrooms. And it pisses me off because it wasn't <laughs> high enough on my list. But, hey, it was a good <laughs> freaking yard. Um, that's what I get. Learn that one the hard way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sit in the bathtub with my knees up like this. Like, oh, I'm yeah. it out. <laughs> but I got a nice backyard. Uh, That's the important part. Yeah. Right. The dogs are comfortable and they take a shit. So, you know, for the pet owner or the person, you know, who's getting into working dogs and it's like buying a house. You know, you, hopefully you can work with someone like I work with a realtor to buy a house. Hopefully, you know, I, I think right off the bat, especially pet dog owner, find a trainer first. Find a trainer first, please. It will make everything so much easier because that trainer can treat you like my realtor, you know, treated me like, let's sit down let's talk about things. You know, Nesbeth, you said make a list. You're damn right you need to make a list. And you, you, But sometimes the pet owner doesn't know enough to ask to know what that needs to be on that list. So like we all can ask that person questions that they never would have asked themselves. Yeah. You know, are you a morning person? Well, what the fuck's that got to do with anything? Oh, it's got to do with a lot. <laughs> you're breaking a puppy, and you're gonna be up at one o'clock, and then you're gonna be up again at four thirty. You know, and you can't be in a pissing mood because that puppy's looking at you for leadership, guidance, and trust. And if you're not a morning person, well, let's think about maybe an older puppy for you. You know, things like that. Um, so uh, that's a. Uh, a good starting point, regardless of working or pet, you know, get with someone who you're going to be working with to help you identify what your needs are, what your wants, and then ask you those questions that you're not going to ask yourself. You know, in terms of what types of things might be different, I don't know, because I, I really think some of these things are universal, like a stable freaking dog, a puppy that when you pick them up, isn't screaming and shitting or turning around and going batshit nuts on you. Like, how about the one who's just like, all right, this is cool. This is fair. I get it. Let's see what happens. You yeah. know, that middle of the road puppy is, is a good starting point. And you can branch off from there, depending on the needs of that home. It's kind of a tough question to answer with any, um, well, you know, all pet owners should look for this in a dog. You know, no, because we don't know how active your home is. We don't know what your hobbies are. We don't know if you're a morning person. Um, you know, definitely it's easier to say what everybody should stay away from. You know, stay away from the shy puppy. You know, the one that hides in the corner. The only thing they're good for is virtue signaling on Instagram about how you saved this poor little puppy. Look how pathetic he looks. I'm a good person. You know, <laughs> want to try to make, people, you know, hey, listen, there's a lot of people out there that actually give a shit what complete strangers think about them. And, you know, those people can get the shitter scared puppy that they'll end up sending to a shelter anyway. Um, but everyone else with any self-respect and decency can can work on getting a puppy that's stable and that actually has some flexibility. And at that point, we can specify with the specifics based on the needs of the owner. It's hard to make a blanket like, well, you should look for this, you should look for that. It's probably easier with canine. I think it, that's yeah. a much easier question yeah. to answer. Yeah. So at, the end, at that point, they either have it or they don't. I mean, and Mike, how do you see this a lot too? Like the, like the the one thing I always like talk to people about, like when they're looking at like law enforcement or just like even personal protection stuff. I'm always like, do is like, there's a specific amount of temporary behavior a puppy will maintain for the first whatever 12, 14, 16 weeks of a dog's life that can dissipate. And like I've seen this a lot, like. And like in Schutzen, you know, you get these like dogs who are super crazy. And everyone, everyone always uses, you know, fear stages, fear stages. They're going through this stuff. They're going through that. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of it, especially when it comes into the bite work, you know, there's a lot of things like either the dog has like, you know, the dominant factors of what we want uh, and we're trying to work our way through it or they just don't have it and we're just making excuses for it. Uh, and, and that's like the one thing when it comes into like law enforcement that I've noticed, like with the selection, like we're because we don't do the large volume of things of dogs like we're extremely selective in particular as far as 
the dogs that we take in and, you know, also age range of, of that too, because, you know, that's that point where you have dogs who are going to be, you know, that's protecting someone's life, life or like, you know, could be, you know, an asset where it can actually be a, a liability. Yeah. I, I think, you know, to be fair, I think a lot of times those puppies that, that have it really young and then it kind of dissipates. I don't know if I necessarily blame the puppy or the dog. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a lot of solid dogs kind of fizzle out as they age. Uh, but I, I'm also a big fan of like, you got to know your dog and your puppy. And sometimes less is more. If, if we give them as a puppy, we're just so excited that we have a puppy that does good and bite stuff and they're biting all the time. Well, what we're really doing is like letting that puppy know that, hey, biting stuff's not that valuable. Like it's, it, it's not a hot commodity anymore because you're just doing it every, and they just burn out. It's like a kid, those kids that, um, you know, the parents want them to be NFL stars. And they like football when they first start, but then they're at practice seven days a week. Outside of that, they're they're running them outside, and eventually, kids just like, bro, I, screw football. Like I don't. So I, I think that's part of the factor that that can like phase into like making dogs kind of or puppies fade out. But my number one excuse that I hate from um, you know working dog kind of breeders or vent is the dog's just a slow maturer. Like, it, it, uh, like the to me, showing certain traits isn't based off of a dog's, like there are certain things that aren't based off of a dog's maturity level that I should be able to see throughout the dog's life. You know, a, a want to be independent, uh, you know, the, a want or desire to possess things, a desire to chase after things that are like to me that shouldn't be in relation to necessarily like a dog's maturity level right if we're talking about hey a dog's confidence when it comes to actually being in combat with a man then yeah okay now maturity level matters a, a bit yeah. more than this dog wants to so like I, I see it all the time hey the dog's two and a half years old but he's a slow mature so he doesn't really hunt that well or his environmentals aren't that doesn't nothing, nothing to do with maturity to me. Yeah, it kills like, me. It has to do with just the dog might not have it, you know. So I, I think also you know, you know, there's kennel blindness is a is a is a a very damaging thing, and sometimes people in the working dog community uh, they refuse to see things that are right in front of them. Uh, you know, it's like willful ignorance uh, and yep. making excuses. Uh, so I, I, that's my pet peeve is that maturity thing. And I'm not the guy that thinks you should be taking a, a six month old puppy and putting it on a bite suit and doing adult dog things with it. I'm not saying that, but I'm also saying maturity is not an excuse for a flat dog. Smoke bombs and flamethrowers are okay though, aren't they? <laughs> definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> Blank guns, you know, all the pressure in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I definitely, I mean, I agree with that stuff. I mean, like, especially, you know, especially nowadays with like, you know, I think Katie brought a good point when we talked like a couple questions back is that social media is, it's been a great thing. Like obviously we're together because of social media, but it, it also can be something that can be deceiving in the, in the matter of like, okay, like you can take 15 second clip out of a video and either make someone look good or bad. You know, like, and, and that's the thing that I think a lot of people should do. Like for me, like on our social media, like every everything is transparent uh, yes please everything is transparent uh everything is right this is i mean you guys have talked to me multiple times you know it's pretty much face value and like i've, I've talked to you guys a bunch of times i mean katie and i talked the other day and like we think you know, mike and i were talking before as i do it's like you know it's it's pretty much the normal stuff with it so i mean like that's like the big thing like the understanding of you, know, you got to kind of have these conversations and talk to people especially when you're looking for a puppy and making sure that you know, like you're getting exactly what you're saying because you know like what you said he said it's kennel blindness uh, there's someone else that said it. it's like you know you look sometimes people look through the lens it's like rose colored glasses you know like you're always kind of looking at it like this you know the, your your stuff's the best like you've been sipping your own juice a little bit too much or believing in your own hype and you know, i think that's extremely common especially in the working dog world is everyone's like okay the dogs are you know these, these my dogs are the greatest my dogs are the greatest it's like you're gonna have one or two they're gonna be like I mean, we've had that. We've had, we've had that. With like You're our being kind. Time. One, one or two, man. I, I've seen people with like 99% uh, success rates with litters. I was like, bro, they got the magic sauce. Cause I don't know. 
I think, you know, I, I ultimately think it just comes down, like, it, it comes down to, you know, some people, uh, you know, there's some securities and there's insecurities. You know, me personally, I always, anytime I have the chance to learn from, I know that there's thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, millions of people that know more than I know. Right. And anytime that there's someone that I can get information from, I want to do it. We talked talked about it a couple of days ago when I had um, me and Carlos had a seminar in Marion County with the sheriff's office down there. And KD came by, you know, after the seminar is done, we have a big it was a decoy seminar. We have a, a, a big portion of it. Um, it's about, you know, utilizing operant conditioning uh, in, as a decoy, uh, you know, and. If Katie's sitting in the room, like my, I'm gonna try and get my 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 dues, right? So as soon as everything's done, everyone clears, I was like, Katie, where did we fuck up? What do we need to fix? Like, help me, man. He offers feedback, you know, and if anything that I could do for Katie or you, I, I you know, it's the same thing. I don't have all the answers, but where I'm like, hey, you know what? Touch on this a little bit more, you know, expand on this. I don't know if it's sunk in too well. And you know, we make those adjustments and and, and move forward. Oh, definitely, man. That's a uh... We got, I got, it's funny. So I'll, I'll give you like an example. So we did our first litter um, with a devil and a, a dog we had named Six. Uh, and I, I'm sure you guys have probably heard this, but like, you know, devil doesn't, devil is a dog who a lot of people don't like, <laughs> especially because they, they're like, you know, Hans markets them well and all this other stuff. So we went down to Gold Coast and we bred with our dog Six from who's like Reed Kennels. And I don't, I can't even tell you like how many people, like just hated on that litter right away. And like that, when we talk about like, you know, you get one or two, like for me, like out of that litter, we got eight dogs um, and all eight are completely workable. And it was like one of those, like we we had to end up um, spaying six because she got sick from it. She, she almost ended up dying from that whole birthing process, but we got lucky on that. You know, like that was like one of the things I was like, damn, it was like all of them, like Gary, um, he's actually works for Las Vegas Metro PD. And then we have Ozzy out of them, our dog, Lucy, you know, she's a bit weird, but when it comes to, or, or the depending on like what you said, like the list, you know, the list of things that you want from a dog. I mean, those all dogs had like that list that we needed. Um, I think like, except for like one or like two, but you know, it, we got lucky on that one. And then we did our Aussie uh, Gila breeding and that one, you know, everyone came out and, and as far as size, what we wanted, not what we wanted at all, because all the dogs became gigantic. And we didn't want them to be gigantic because the whole idea was to have them, you know, more compact and a little more usable so they can go in and out of a cruiser or going in and out of a car without, you know, looking like a Mastiff Dutch Shepherd or Malinois coming in and out of the car. Um, and then, you know, I have all, all of them, you know, came out pretty much what we wanted. I, I just have, and I have Zilla, you know, Zilla who he looks great and he does his bite work and everything like that, but he's probably like the friendliest fucking dog like in the planet. Like he's a lab with a Dutch body. And like, he just like, if he came to the house, like we can do a sport work with them and he's going to be great, but he's not going to have that civil edge that we wanted. So, you know, it's always like that expectation thing. Let's see here. All right, Mike, I think you're, uh, you're next on the questions. All right. Um, what do I got here? All right, this one will be, I don't think we talked about any detection stuff. So we have um, from Josh Rowe on Instagram. Um, your thoughts on handler queuing impacting a solicited final response from the canine? So that would be direct direct reward to the actual thing as far as... Uh... I think, I think it, the question is just how much is, uh, handlers... How can handler queuing affect a final response um, in detection work? I, I believe is what the it, intent of the question is. So I, I first before we even. Oh, well, I'm literally he's out of here. On, on that note, he was like, "I'm out of here." <laughs> now my my phone's always fucking. <laughs> I get so many questions on this thing, but uh. So for me, like, I don't, I, detection is not my thing. Like, I, I understand the really basics of it um, and, like, how to build it and, like, all this other stuff. But as far as, you know, going into detail, so, like, I'll give you, like, I think, like, anything handler-based as far as indication, you know, I, I think it can, like, what you said, like, Mike, too, is, like, you know, the independence, it takes away the independence, the drive to want to do it if it's being pushed by the handler. Um, but, you know, like I said, I, 
I mean, detection for me is like, you know, I have, I have the, literally the caveman uh, way of learning of it. And, you know, that's kind of where I've, I've, I've learned it. But I know if a dog is too reliant on the actual handler to cue the responses, I, it does like to take away from the actual detection aspect of it and the identification of it because they're constantly being like, what the fuck do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And not really uh, pushed into the actual, like learning and trying to get the actual scent. So I mean, like that for me would be like my answer, but again, my, uh, my, uh, scale on that is my scope on that is like nothing <laughs> zero. Yeah. Same with me. It's theoretical. It's, it's a, it's something on my list to do. Um, now my, I, I definitely have an answer for it. You know what I mean? Um, but it's just not an answer based on me training hundreds of detection dogs. It's my answer based on, you know, being a student of this damn craft and having been very privileged to be around some of whom I consider and who those in the know consider to be some of the best to ever teach a dog how to hunt there is. Um, kind of defeats the purpose if the handler is cueing them. Like, let's just, I mean, and, and you don't have to have trained a, a damn odor dog to, to be able to understand this concept that the last thing you need is a handler going through pointing to everything in front of the dog like last time i checked dogs were pretty good at hunting it kind of yeah. had something to do with how we realized that we wanted them in our lives over fifteen thousand years ago um we just kind of let them go out and use that nose thing and find shit, and then tell us <laughs> where it is and then we went and killed it and ate it you know i don't you know i don't think when you go back to you know, pre-agricultural revolution, paleolithic human canine relationships, they weren't out there going, is this a mammoth? Is this the mammoth? Is this the mammoth? Is this the... Wait, wait, whoa, whoa, over here? No, they let the dog do it. So to look at handler cues, never mind the massive field bay that a defensive, a defense attorney is going to have if we're talking law enforcement and, and, and starting to nitpick apart that training with, you know, how much input did the handler have on that dog's indication that resulted in a possible fourth amendment you know yeah gosh it just opens up a huge door that i'm not qualified to talk about other than posing the question for discussion or chiming in a little bit handler cues man let the dog go hunt damn it yeah. Yeah. I, I i i i agree with uh katie and mike there i um you know there's uh have you guys heard of Clever Hans before? The horse, Clever Hans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you, if for the listeners, if you haven't listened to or, or heard about it, quick Google search. There's something called the Clever Hans effect, um, and pretty much it's about unintentional cues that were made to this horse. Uh, it's actually a pretty cool story. I'm going to butcher it, so I'm not even going to tell it. But it's about <laughs> this horse that was reading its handler and actually other people that were around and receiving cues and doing pretty complex mathematical equations based off of it. Uh, and this is with an unintentional cue happening. So they weren't trying to cue this horse. They didn't know uh, that the horse was even picking up on them. So I think if we know as a handler uh, where a hide is or where we want our dog to search specifically, we can try our best to act like we're not cueing the dog, but we're giving them cues. They're, they're, it's happening, you know, there's things that are out of our control, uh, you know, at, our pace might slow down ever so slightly when we get close to that source. Uh, you know, things like we might hold our breath really quick when they get there and, and the dog's picking up on all of these things. You might not be aware of it, but they're picking up on it. You know, simple things like, hey, if, if you're a handler, I guarantee this happens in your training if you're not conscious of it. If you know where that hide is, you get into the room and you look where the hide is. You'll stand, you'll be on the other side of the room, but you're going to stare at where that hide is over there. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, make the, let there be a hide in the room and face the other way and watch Let's see what your dog does offline. Don't look the hide, have the hide behind you and look at the other side of the room. If your dog hasn't been exposed to this, he's probably only going to continue to search in front of you where it's not what we want them to do. Um, so I think handler cueing is a huge problem. If you're doing it to try and teach your dog, you know, the right indication that you want, I think that you jumped ahead of steps and you shouldn't even be involved in that picture. 
I think your dog should know what indication is. And when odor's there, let your dog work independently. The biggest thing to help you with battling handler, handler cues is double blind searches where you don't know where the odor is and someone else does know where the odor is. Um, and go about that. Obviously, using a marker system would make it way easier than trying to throw a ball there on time because obviously that builds handler cues as well, right? The dog gets close to where the source is and you reach for your ball and the dog, oh, sh okay, I'm, I'm, I'm close. It must be around here somewhere, right? Um, the other thing is you don't have the, the chance to have someone helping you with those double blind hides, uh, buy a baby monitor. They're pretty friggin' cheap. Put it in the room where, uh, you know, in a corner where the hide is uh, well, adjacent to the hide or so you can view the entire room and stay outside of the room. When your dog indicates to odor, you give them a marker, dog comes back and gets paid. You know, you want to battle those handler cues as much as you can because your dog's reading you 100%. <laughs> he's looking at you and he's noticing things. So if, when it can be controlled and it's in a training scenario, let the dog work and you stay out of the way. Definitely. That would be mine. <laughs> I would say Mike, Mike would be the, the the one on that one to give the definitive answer. <laughs> uh, I did um, or one of my trainers. Uh, he went to one of Cameron Ford's um, seminars, um, and because we work like you know mostly with like personal protection and dogs, who are going to be like super I like basically IDing and filling off like the handler. You know that was the one thing I think like and Carlos had actually worked him too. Uh, his name is Sid, but um, like you can tell like he wasn't like he was just. He, but for Matt, what told me is like he was just kind of like waiting for that direction because of like how he was trained for those cues. And like you see it like a lot, I see a lot in like an obedience, like just the fact that like you know, when we tell dogs, like when I tell my clients, you know, tell your doctor down, they do like this and they say, Come this, especially in the beginning, they're like, The dog's like, That's a cue, so I need, do I go down or do I go this way to you? So like, there's just different physical cues and stuff like that. I've noticed that like with dogs will start pairing into and like, like you said you know putting those you know kind of making those like mathematical equations like okay like that movement plus that word means this yeah and but movement kind of is what they're going to observe they're going to observe move i always tell people i'm like oh your dog knows down they're like yeah and i was like all right hold the food in your hand and say down and lift the food up yeah so let's see what your dog <laughs> and down the dog boop, goes into a sit i'm like he knows what you're doing with the food he doesn't know what what the words are right so like that physical you know communication to them is the easiest thing for them to pick up so when we go into detection work we have to be aware of that because that's going to be something for us to battle right we don't want them to be reading us they're they're with us because they're really good at reading us and manipulating us right that's why yeah. they're here that's why they're with us so we have to be you know cognizant of that and, and, and you know set up that. proofs to, to, to make sure that that's not part of the picture that we don't want them to have I think that opens up to a an incredibly valuable line of, of thinking, discussion, what have you, for all, not just working dog, uh, but even the pet owners watching. Like you, you really need everybody needs to take a time out and realize, reflect on, accept whatever you want to call it, the immense potential for understanding and interpreting us that these dogs have. Like like Nesbeth just said, like they're, it's why they're here. Um, it's why I spend a significant amount of time with my pet clients talking about the history of Canis familiaris. Like we gotta understand how to spell dog. And University of Duke has, a, um, has an interesting program that they've been running for years, canine cognition. They do a lot of re research, you know, as close to research as you can probably get. Uh, without the air quotes. Um, and, I, you know, I recall a while ago, they, they did a really fascinating study that is incredibly valuable to everyone with a dog. And they put ch chimpanzees up against dogs in this competition, this test, where they did the whole little, like, move the cup around with the peanut or whatever, and you got, you know, the game, you guess which one it is. Yeah. Well, the only clue that the, the animals had was the researcher i believe they were pointing and then they did uh, they did that right yeah chimpanzees, like whatever like it was random there was no the dogs nailed it like like consistent 
data with multiple dogs, unknown relationships with the handler. The dogs were able to interpret that the human was signaling that's where it is. Yeah. The they, they even did they, they even did because some of the debates were that oh it might have been like tr unintentionally trained behaviors. So they got people to start pointing with their feet because no one at home is pointing, you know, hey, go over here, Fluffy. Um, and the dogs, you know, the, the data still remain the same. Um, so like they obviously, like they read us, man. It's, this isn't, it's not new. We know they read us. There's just stuff supporting that, right? So we got to like, be aware. Yeah, that's like the big thing too. It's like, you know, I, I said it before, it's like, you know, when you have these do like dogs, for example, like, you know, everyone's like, oh, you know, they're this wild animal. They're not really doing like, you know, they're a wolf per se, right? You know, definitely not like, you know, a lot of what they have and what they understand is what they read off of us and how we cue them into things. Like even like, like what you guys just said, like the sim the simplest of things, like a routine or waking up at a specific time or moving your body, like doing certain ways, like during obedience commands. And like, you know, what you guys just described when it comes to like nose work and finding things, like, you know, that stuff they're queuing in. So, I mean, they're, they're watching and then they're, and they're learning, you know, as we go through it, you know, like that's why, you know, the, the clicker systems and like the, the consistent marker systems are really important. And I think that ties into another thing where when we start over vocalizing, you know, praise or just like over vocalizing, you know, repeating commands and doing all this other stuff, you know, it starts to lose value and the dog starts to like, you know, get a little more confused by the more we add that into it because they are consistently watching. They are consistently like, what the fuck did you need me to do? <laughs> like, what, what, what was that? It, I just heard a bunch of blah, 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 blah. Like, I didn't get the actual note of what to do. So I, mean, I think that plays in a part with that as well. No, definitely. And, and you know, the more, the more you talk, the less they hear, right? The, yep. more, the more you're saying like, okay, sound doesn't matter. Let me look at what you're doing. Because obviously it's just white noise, right? Isn't so, that what marriage oh, is? Yeah, that's why I know. <laughs> oh, Mike, Mike left again. <laughs> oh, Mike, he pleaded the fifth. He turned his camera off. I, that's the best part about that is that I'm divorced. So like, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I feel that lesson. <laughs> um, let's see. Is it Nesbeth? No, Nesbeth, you just won, right? So it's my oh, turn on the mind. questions. All right. Let me find one here. So this one's from Operant Canines. Uh, what is your opinion on puppies burning out from being overworked? Oh, you're. <laughs> That's you it. That. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I said I, I definitely think it's a, you know, anytime that there's, I kind of look at puppies and dogs in general as like, you know, capitalism. Like things need to be like supply and demand. If if we just oversupply access to everything uh you know get a fat dog to work for food if it's not a lab or a golden you know it's it, it, it's pretty hard you know the same thing i would say goes for uh for bite work if they just get to bite all the time it, it's no longer that special to them you know we want the I want it to be i like my bite work sessions with puppies and older dogs for the most part with them leaving with those drives actually not satisfied like i want them to still want more if, if if we're always 100% satisfying those drives, then it's not that special, man. If if I'm if I'm a millionaire and there's two dollars on the floor, I might just walk past and not pick it up. If I'm homeless and there's two dollars on the floor, I'm pick like it's really valuable to me, right? Perspective I'm picking that up. <laughs> that it that it, it it definitely. But there's also the other side of identifying again what your criteria is for that puppy right do you want a lot of horsepower do you want that dog to be go mode every time you take them out or do you want that dog to kind of get drive satisfied and and be a little calmer um you know for me I, i'm i'm horsepower 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 before breaks you know um so i can i can talk from my perspective what do you think katie I, I can't add anything to that. I mean, it's the same type of perspective in the same glasses I'm looking through with everything. Whether we're talking about an obedience dog, we're talking about bite work, like, you know, there you can overdo it. You can overfulfill. You can, like, why not put them away hungry? Why not put them away still wanting more? Isn't that kind of like what we're supposed to, to we, we tell the, our, our clients, whether they're 
pet or working like that's i had nothing to add man you you nailed it yeah i mean i would say i would say the same thing you know you always want to kind of put them up hot on wanting to actually work more um wanting to actually get more i think there's a lot of things that we can do to switch up you know from being overworked like for me like i work my dogs pretty much like every day but i i will switch like how i work them or like the times of uh, amount that I, how I work them like I but the, at the end of the day like I'm always like I want you to want more of this whether it's you know when bite work you know I'll switch into like muzzle work go from you know suit work and go into hidden sleep work and this kind of agitation will vary all this other stuff when it comes to obedience like they work for their food so you know it's it's always you know constantly like okay like you're done with that okay cool we'll put you away that you'll get your yeah. food later and yeah and, and I think it's Go, sorry. I, yeah, I, th I think it's about just identifying what you want. Like there's a, a time in a dog's life. Uh, like, for instance, when I'm teaching an out to a dog, after they know to out like off of toys and stuff uh, where particular dogs, I'm like, hey, you're going to be biting a decoy right now for 20 minutes. Like this drive is going to get satisfied because if I give you a quick bite for 10 seconds and then try to I'm fighting a battle where I'm going to have to start adding aversion into the picture and punishment and i don't want to do that i don't want it to i want them to pretty much be satisfied where it's like okay i'm okay with letting this go right now so it's identifying goals but again, if you overwork if i did that every single time i worked the dog even an older dog it's not going to be that special to them we want these things to, we want them to do it you know with everything they have and we got to keep those things special again uh bite action work tracking obedient whatever you're doing behavior do we even behavior. do we even do now like with that puppy i have set like my girl will she'll have like the little breaker bar and she'll fucking pop her off of like a bite like on my bicep and pull her away and like that'll be at mid-session just middles just like she wants to go more and i'll agitate as we go through it um so yeah. roman <laughs> who's on the back end of this uh just know, let us know that we have like four minutes before this thing cuts off completely um oh. so i guess we do have a time limit on here um well we found it thank you Roman. Yeah. The <laughs> hey but uh you know well, cheers to you guys man i appreciate you guys uh Hello. you guys are Hello. you guys are awesome i appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to do this stuff um and yeah i mean you guys will be on more and more but yeah i appreciate you guys and then i appreciate everyone who's tuned in on this i uh, we first we basically killed two hours without a stop so <laughs> Well, th thank we can you. talk a lot. Yeah, we can. Thank you to both of you guys. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Primal Caner, for the opportunity. Awesome stuff. Yeah, man. Thanks again to you and KD. You know, it's always good talking to you guys. Always takes away from it. And you know, be getting sooner than later. I'm going to hit you guys offline here after this. But, <laughs> but thanks, brothers. I appreciate <laughs> you guys. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who tuned in. Uh, hell yeah, dude. Yeah, thanks for yeah. everyone who listened to us for fucking two hours. <laughs> Just talk about dogs and ramble on about stuff. So thanks. If, if it wasn't enough, you could shoot us some messages too. Hell yeah. Hit up KD, <laughs> hit up fucking Mike, um, you know, grassroots K9, KD on Instagram. Uh, hit these guys up. I mean, if people who are following me and haven't necessarily uh, heard these guys yet, these guys are you know, top of the line dog trainers and just, you know, people coaches and everything like that. These are great people to work with. So make sure you guys hit these guys up, you know, best in the business. So appreciate you guys. All right. Appreciate it, man. Later, guys. Have a good one.